This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapters 33 and 34. Chapter 33 Victory. A day of chilling winds and gloomy skies, Rilla quoted one Sunday afternoon, the 6th of October to be exact. It was so cold that they had lighted a fire in the living room, and the merry little flames were doing their best to counteract the outside dourness. It's more like November than October. November is such an ugly month. Cousin Sophia was there, having again forgiven Susan, and Mrs. Martin Clough, who was not visiting on Sunday but had dropped in to borrow Susan's cure for rheumatism, that being cheaper than getting one from the doctor. "'I'm afeard we're going to have an early winter,' foreboded Cousin Sophia. "'The muskrats are building awful big houses round the pond, and that's a sign that never fails. "'Dear me, how that child has grown!' Cousin Sophia sighed again, as if it were an unhappy circumstance that a child should grow. "'When do you expect his father?' "'Next week,' said Rilla. "'Well, I hope the stepmother won't abuse the poor child,' sighed Cousin Sophia. "'But I have my doubts. I have my doubts.' "'Anyhow, he'll be sure to feel the difference between his usage here and what he'll get anywhere else. "'You've spoiled him so, Rilla, waiting on him hand and foot the way you've always done.' Rilla smiled and pressed her cheek to Jim's curls. She knew sweet-tempered, sunny little Jim's was not spoiled. Nevertheless, her heart was anxious behind her smile. She, too, thought much about the new Mrs. Anderson, and wondered uneasily what she would be like. "'I can't give Jim's up to a woman who won't love him,' she thought rebelliously. "'I believe it's going to rain,' said Cousin Sophia. "'We have had an awful lot of rain this fall already. "'It's going to make it awful hard for people to get their roots in. "'It wasn't so in my young days. "'We generally had beautiful Octobers then, "'but the seasons is altogether different now from what they used to be.' "'Clear across Cousin Sophia's doleful voice cut the telephone bell. "'Gertrude Oliver answered it. "'Yes? What? What? Is it true? Is it official? "'Thank you! Thank you!' Gertrude turned and faced the room dramatically, her dark eyes flashing, her dark face flushed with feeling. All at once the sun broke through the thick clouds and poured through the big crimson maple outside the window. Its reflected glow enveloped her in a weird, immaterial flame. She looked like a priestess performing some mystic, splendid rite. "'Germany and Austria are suing for peace,' she said. Rilla went crazy for a few minutes. She sprang up and danced around the room, clapping her hands, laughing, crying. "'Sit down, child,' said Mrs. Clough, who never got excited over anything, and so had missed a tremendous amount of trouble and delight in her journey through life. "'Oh!' cried Rilla. "'I have walked the floor for hours in despair and anxiety these past few years. Now let me walk in joy. It was worth living long, dreary years for this minute, and it would be worth living them again just to look back to it. Susan, let's run up the flag, and we must phone the news to everyone in the Glen.' "'Can we have as much sugar as we want to now?' asked Jims eagerly. It was a never-to-be-forgotten afternoon. As the news spread, excited people ran about the village and dashed up to Ingleside. The Merediths came over and stayed to supper, and everybody talked and nobody listened. Cousin Sophia tried to protest that Germany and Austria were not to be trusted and that it was all part of a plot, but nobody paid the least attention to her. "'This Sunday makes up for that one in March,' said Susan. "'I wonder,' said Gertrude dreamily, apart to Rilla, "'if things won't seem rather flat and insipid when peace really comes.' After being fed for four years on horrors and fears, terrible reverses, amazing victories, won't anything less be tame and uninteresting? How strange and blessed and dull it will be not to dread the coming of the mail every day. We must dread it for a little while yet, I suppose, said Rilla. Peace won't come, can't come, for some weeks yet, and in those weeks dreadful things may happen. My excitement is over. We have won the victory. But, oh, what a price we have paid! "'Not too high a price for freedom,' said Gertrude softly. "'Do you think it was, Rilla?' "'No,' said Rilla under her breath. "'She was seeing a little white cross on a battlefield of France. "'No. Not if those of us who live will show ourselves worthy of it. "'If we keep faith.' "'We will keep faith,' said Gertrude. "'She rose suddenly. A silence fell around the table, "'and in the silence Gertrude repeated Walter's famous poem, The Piper.' When she finished, Mr. Meredith stood up and held up his glass. "'Let us drink,' he said, "'to the silent army, to the boys who followed when the piper summoned. For to-morrow they gave their to-day. Theirs is the victory.' 
End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 Mr. Hyde goes to his own place, and Susan takes a honeymoon. Early in November Jims left Ingleside. Rilla saw him go with many tears, but a heart free from boding. Mrs. Jim Anderson, number two, was such a nice little woman that one was rather inclined to wonder at the luck which bestowed her on Jim. She was rosy-faced and blue-eyed and wholesome, with the roundness and trigness of a geranium leaf. Rilla saw at first glance that she was to be trusted with Jim's. "'I'm fond of children, miss,' she said heartily. "'I'm used to them. I've left six little brothers and sisters behind me. Jim's is a dear child, and I must say you've done wonders in bringing him up so healthy and handsome. I'll be as good to him as if he was my own, miss. And I'll make Jim toe the line all right. He's a good worker. All he needs is someone to keep him at it and to take charge of his money. We've rented a little farm just out of the village, and we're going to settle down there. Jim wanted to stay in England, but I says no. I hankered to try a new country, and I've always thought Canada would suit me. I'm so glad you're going to live near us. You'll let Jim's come here often, won't you? I love him dearly. No doubt you do, miss, for a love of blood child I never did see. We understand, Jim and me, what you've done for him, and you won't find us ungrateful. He can come here whenever you want him, and I'll always be glad of any advice from you about his bringing up. He's more your baby than anyone else's, I should say, and I'll see that you get your fair share of him, miss. So Jim's went away, with the soup tureen, though not in it. Then the news of the armistice came, and even Glen St. Mary went mad. That night the village had a bonfire and burned the Kaiser in effigy. The fishing village boys turned out and burned all the sand hills off in one grand, glorious conflagration that extended for seven miles. Up at Ingleside, Rilla ran laughing to her room. "'Now I'm going to do a most unladylike and inexcusable thing,' she said, as she pulled her green velvet hat out of its box. "'I am going to kick this hat about the room until it is without form and void, and I shall never, as long as I live, wear anything of that shade of green again.' "'You've certainly kept your vow pluckily,' laughed Miss Oliver. "'It wasn't pluck, it was sheer obstinacy. I'm rather ashamed of it,' said Rilla, kicking joyously. "'I wanted to show mother. It's mean to want to show your own mother. Most unfilial conduct. But I have shown her, and I've shown myself a few things. Oh, Miss Oliver, just for one moment I'm really feeling quite young again, young and frivolous and silly. Didn't I ever say November was an ugly month? Why, it's the most beautiful month in the whole year. Listen to the bells ringing in Rainbow Valley.' I never heard them so clearly. They're ringing for peace, and new happiness, and all the dear, sweet, sane, homey things that we can have again now, Miss Oliver. Not that I am sane just now. I don't pretend to be. The whole world is having a little crazy spell today. Soon we'll sober down and keep faith, and begin to build up our new world. But just for today, let's be mad and glad. Susan came in from the outdoor sunlight, looking supremely satisfied. Mr. Hyde is gone, she announced. Gone? "'Do you mean he is dead, Susan?' "'No, Mrs. Dr. dear. That beast is not dead. But you will never see him again, I feel sure of that. Don't be so mysterious, Susan. What has happened to him?' "'Well, Mrs. Dr. dear, he was sitting out on the back steps this afternoon. It was just after the news came that the armistice had been signed, and he was looking his hidest. I can assure you he was an awesome-looking beast. All at once, Mrs. Dr. dear, Bruce Meredith came around the corner of the kitchen, walking on his stilts. He has been learning to walk on them lately, and came over to show me how well he could do it. Hyde just took a look, and one bound carried him over the yard fence. Then he went tearing through the maple grove in great leaps with his ears laid back. You never saw a creature so terrified, Mrs. Dr. dear. He has never returned. Oh, he'll come back, Susan, probably chastened in spirit by his fright. We will see, Mrs. Dr. dear. We will see. Remember, the armistice has been signed. And that reminds me that Whiskers on the Moon had a paralytic stroke last night. I am not saying it is a judgment on him, because I am not in the councils of the Almighty, but one can have one's own thoughts about it. Neither Whiskers on the Moon nor Mr. Hyde will be much more heard of in Glen St. Mary, Mrs. Dr. dear, and that you may tie to. Mr. Hyde certainly was heard of no more. As it could hardly have been his fright that kept him away, the Ingleside folk decided that some dark fate of shot or poison had descended on him except Susan, who believed and continued to affirm that he had merely gone to his own place. Rilla lamented him, for she had been very fond of her stately golden pussy, and had liked him quite as well in his weird hide moons as in his tame Jekyll ones. "'And now, Mrs. Dr. dear,' said Susan, "'since the fall house-cleaning is over, and the garden truck is all safe in cellar, I am going to take a honeymoon to celebrate the peace.' "'A honeymoon, Susan?' "'Yes, Mrs. Dr. dear, a honeymoon,' repeated Susan firmly. I shall never be able to get a husband, but I am not going to be cheated out of everything, and a honeymoon I intend to have. I am going to Charlottetown to visit my married brother and his family. 
His wife has been ailing all the fall, but nobody knows whether she is going to die or not. She never did tell any one what she was going to do until she did it. That is the main reason why she was never liked in our family. But to be on the safe side, I feel that I should visit her. I have not been in town for over a day for twenty years, and I have a feeling that I might as well see one of those moving pictures there is so much talk of, so as not to be wholly out of the swim. But have no fear that I shall be carried away with them, Mrs. Dr. dear. I shall be away a fortnight if you can spare me so long. You certainly deserve a good holiday, Susan. Better take a month. That is the proper length for a honeymoon. No, Mrs. Dr. dear. A fortnight is all I require. Besides, I must be home for at least three weeks before Christmas to make the proper preparations. We will have a Christmas that is a Christmas this year, Mrs. Dr. dear. Do you think there is any chance of our boys being home for it? No, I think not, Susan. Both Jem and Shirley write that they don't expect to be home before spring. It may be even midsummer before Shirley comes. But Carl Meredith will be home, and Nan and I, and we will have a grand celebration once more. We'll set chairs for all, Susan, as you did at our first war Christmas. Yes, for all. For my dear lad, whose chair must always be vacant, as well as for the others, Susan. It is not likely I would forget his place, Mrs. Dr. dear, said Susan, wiping her eyes as she departed to pack up for her honeymoon. End of chapter 34